From the Chronicle Podcast System, this is the December 23rd episode of SLP. SLP stands for Sheer Listening Pleasure, featuring your host, Neil Shear. In each episode, Neil offers his opinions and comments, speaks with his guests about dermatology, and, sometimes, one or two other passions. Support for the SLP podcast is provided by Leo Pharma Canada. Neil's guest today is Dr. Mark Bercier. Dr. Bercier is a clinical dermatologist and researcher in Moncton, New Brunswick. If you have a question for Neil or his guest, or want to be in touch at any time, just send an email to slp at chronicle.org. And, if you attach a voice clip, we might even use your question on an upcoming episode. And now, here's your host, the Derm Boss himself, Neil Shear. Welcome to everybody, and I, I really am very excited that I'm speaking with Dr. Marc Boursier, who's in New Brunswick, and is actually a global star in dermatology, and has been a leader in many areas from clinical trials and looking at terrible diseases like hydronitis suppurativa, and been the president of that group. He's done almost everything you could do, and is still actively at work. So I just want to thank you, Mark, for talking with us today. And I'd like to go back to the beginning for people about when was it in your life, you know, especially in medicine already that you decided dermatology had a future for you? Well, uh, first I should say that I am honored to spend some time with you, Professor Neil. You say a star, but I feel I'm like a falling star right now because the shining is getting lower and lower as we speak. But I guess that's life and that's fine. But dermatology, actually, I was definitely not oriented to dermatology when I started my medical school. I wanted to save lives, you know, and do big stuff. So when I was interned, and you may remember, Neil, that back then, you know, there was an internship, you know, for two years and then residency and so on. So during my internship, I was really looking either cardiology or plastic surgery. This was my two main targets. And what happened is that I was quite dedicated if I was doing something I was going full gear. So I spent four months in the coronary care unit and the two months on the floor on the coronary ward, on the so cardiac ward. And I was basically there seven days a week. You know, there was no uh, convention at that time, you know, that you take the day off after, you know, a rotation. You would basically, I was living in the hospital for about six, seven months. And then I said, well, I need a little break, you know, because I have to go back, you know, and probably do my request to go in cardiology. So what happened, I said, well, I need some rest. So I'll take a rotation in dermatology. And I was at the Hospital St. Luke at that time in Montreal. I had no idea where the dermatology department was. So the Monday morning, I asked some direction, where's the dermatology ward? Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, there it is. I went there and within two hours, I had uh, something happen to me. My eyes suddenly open. The people that I've met, what they were asking, the cases that we're seeing that morning were absolutely outstanding. And I realized that the teacher that were there were the brightest, the smartest people that I've seen in that hospital. And I was there maybe for about two years at that time. So I say, hey, you know what? Cardiology is no more an option. So I'm going to try to enter Durham. And you may remember that entering Durham is not necessarily very easy, very, very competitive. So I put my name in, got the interview and received, you know, the information that, yes, you you accepted. So I said, well, I have to give it a try. So I went to my first year in residency in Durham. And after two weeks of being there, Dr. Neil, I was sold. And it's been a passion and it's been a passion for the past 38 years. And I wish to do it again and redo it again, I would not change anything. That's an amazing story. And I think it's, you know, a lot of us, it's amazing how we remember those, those moments and they're like vivid in our mind. You can replay them over and over again, sort of, and think about it, about all of those things and, and being an outsider and coming in and, and learning what dermatology was and the surprise that it brought to you. And in those days too, and I think for me, which is much earlier. Much earlier, much earlier. <laughs> oh, don't even go there. It's a different century. So, you know, I look back on it, and I think, I don't know why it excited me. Part of it was that the clinicians at the hospital I was working at were very respected. And they said, you know what, we don't even know what this person has. They didn't even have a skin problem. And they would send somebody, you know, to dermatology. They said, well, they don't have a skin problem. Yeah, but you might know what's going on. Because, you know, in those days, you just couldn't Google it and find out. 
it was an interesting thing to see that. Also, I think as a lifestyle, did that fit in for you at all? Did you think, you know what, when I'm 50 and I have kids, I'd like to not be rushing to somebody else's chest pain. I'd like to be able to spend time with my family. Dr. Neil, lifestyle was totally not part of the equation for me. My lifestyle at that time was to work, work hard, and try to do the best as I can. So it was not about, you know, I don't want to make calls at night. Because actually, I enjoy, you know, doing rotations. I enjoy, you know, like you're on call in internal medicine at night in the hospital. You get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning and you go on the floor. It's kind of special and I kind of liked it, you know. So I didn't mind this. So the lifestyle for me was not part of the equation. So it was other reasons that made me decide to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. The way it resonated with you. And I think it was at a unique time too in the way that you ended up in New Brunswick. Oh, that was not expected at all. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if you know what happened, but basically I was a resident for at that time uh, with two colleagues, Dr. Yves Poulain that you know very well and Dr. Paul No, that you may not know as much, but we were three and we're very close together during the residency program. And we were planning to open an office, the three of us, in Chateau Gay, which is just besides Montreal. So we had the place, everything was set up. And suddenly, the government at that time put a law, it was called Bill 71, that was cutting the salary by 30% for any new coming on the market if you were within like 100 kilometers of Montreal. So the idea was to send people, you know, in regions. But obviously, this did not work because uh, we said, well, you know, the three of us at 30% less would not cover the expenses. So we had to forget that. So Dr. Nolte and I, we decided to come to Moncton. And Eve, actually, Dr. Poulain went to get snow because it was not part of the area that was covered by the bill. So the three of us, we were planning to be a university, you know, like work with university and do some teaching and so on. We just poof, you know, uh, disappeared. So that's what happened. But actually, you know, I realized that that was probably the best thing that could happen to me because moving to Moncton, I did not know where Moncton was. All right. Okay. So it was my first time in New Brunswick. Okay. So I discovered so nice people, you know, and so we started our practice here and I realized, you know, that I then got involved in clinical trials and being in New Brunswick and the only one who was interested in trials I mean, they were always asking me, who cares if he's good or not? We need somebody in New Brunswick. And I was the only one who would say yes. Okay, So that was actually fantastic. And needless to tell you also that I met uh, who would be my future wife. She's from Shediac, from the area. So everything, you know, like blocked together. And there we are and super happy. Yeah, you never know how it's going to go. Is it fair to even say, I was just thinking that New Brunswick is the only really official, if you will, bilingual province? It is indeed. And actually, Moncton is the only official bilingual city in Canada. All right. And Ottawa, there was a plan for Ottawa to become bilingual, but I'm not too sure that it's done yet. So New Brunswick is the only province officially bilingual and Moncton is the only city officially bilingual. Yeah, that that makes sense. And I think that's certainly an attraction, you know, with your family growing up there and everything. Absolutely. To have it intrinsically actually going on in in real life. You know, Neil, just if I can make just a quick note, uh, you mentioned, you know, family stuff. So when I left for Moncton, my parents were kind of a proof. Are you you sure you want to go there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So because they wanted to keep their little mark close to home. uh, So after being here in Moncton for about six months, my dad told me, he says, Mark, he says, the best decision that you made is to go to Moncton. I was so happy, you know, so I got a greeting from my family for doing that. That's really good. Well, there's so many lessons there, but that's really interesting and very nice to know. I mean, it is hard to move away and, you know, people feel they're losing you. And gee, that's so exciting. So you talked about teaching and research, but then you just, you were saying it sounded like you were going to be winding down in some of this or what? I can't imagine there's such a thing. Unfortunately, you know, you, I guess you have to make decision and you spoke about quality of life earlier. So you have to think about your life also. And the life is not forever. So it has to end somewhere. I am a bit younger than you, but not by much. Okay, I'm turning 68 soon. And uh, I decided about four years ago not to take new clinical trials. That was the most difficult decision that I made in my career. 
is not to take any new projects or trials. And the problem with that is that you know how it works. You do a phase two, which is a year, a year and a half. And then you get involved in a phase three, which is usually four years now, three, four years. So I was 62 and say, you know what? If I get involved right now in new trial, it's going to go on for five, seven years. And if I do it, I want to do it right. And I want to do it to the end. So to be fair with the companies, I felt, you know, that it's probably time to say no. And oh my God, you know, when I was uh, having these like uh, requests, would you like to participate in such and such trial? I would say no. It was breaking my heart. But the decision was made and we're living with the decision and I'm very happy with this. I must say that I'm still privileged to still be part of what is going on. You know, I don't take new trials. I don't do new studies, but I'm still involved in, with what is going on. So maybe not as much as a front line as I used to be, but second line or third line is okay for now. You know, there's so much going on too with all kinds of things are changing and especially, you know, the way ad boards are done and moving towards equity and other issues of representation and all that stuff. So, you know, we do have to move out of the way a little bit. And I also knew that. I don't know, you didn't use the word retirement, but... No, no, no not quite yet. <laughs> I don't do office anymore. So that's maybe considered retirement by some. I will still see a couple of patients, but these are more few friends, you know, so I still have an office and I still pay my dues and my fees and everything. But you cannot book an appointment with me right now. Okay, I won't even try. <laughs> yeah, the retirement thing is like moving to a different country. Although, you know, you could read about it. But when you get there, the rules are, you have no idea. And, you know, how to find somebody to do something and how to do that. And what you should be doing or not doing and what you're told, but it's wrong. It's very challenging in a way, which you think, I don't need this. Now I was trying to get out of that. But over time, you know, you'll find out what you do like, I guess. In a new country of retirement, You'll find out what you really want to do to keep your hand a little bit in something. It's just, it's hard to give it all up unless you have a tractor. I've always said to people, if you have a tractor, then you don't care about anything else. That's, I've heard that from many people in many specialties. They say, what? No, I'm okay. Well, it has to be a big tractor, but not the small one. <laughs> yeah. They said, I have a tractor. So, all right, well, that's good. Then you're good. Now, I just want to ask you about HS. And, and if you think there's other stuff besides heteronotis separativa, that are also, I mean, all of our diseases now are getting a lot of attention, finally. So finally, people recognize that eczema and psoriasis are different diseases, you know, in terms of outside of dermatology. They still don't know what we do. They still don't understand what we do, but there's so much. And then there's the cancer drugs that are causing side effects and all these other things. You've done so much for hydronitis separativa. I guess we don't need to dwell on it too much, but even from that, I mean, what did you learn from that experience yourself? You know, uh, like you have been in practice now for, I guess, a long time. And if I look at, back at my practice and I, if I think of the worst quality of life patients that I've seen over my career, I can think of two diseases. Yes, we've seen terrible psoriasis, pustular psoriasis ending in the hospital. But, you know, you will clear these people fairly quite nicely. But, you know, when we had to deal with a bad but a severe case of HS, that was really breaking my heart. And the other condition was I had a couple of patients with epidermolysis below Z, the bad one. So when I think about a couple of patients with HS and my couple of patients with EB, I mean, I felt so terrible, you know, shoot, I cannot treat these people properly. All right. Okay. Extremely frustrating. But EB is still a very, very difficult challenge. But HS, you know, as time went by, if we look at the past 10 years, what happened with HS, actually, as much as I did not want to see these patients too much because, you know, oh, my God, what's going to happen? I don't want to give you an appointment follow up before six months or whatsoever. Now, these patients are were absolutely welcome in my practice because I have a plan. I have a toolbox. I can do something. I will not cure you because we won't. But I know for sure that I will improve your quality of life from today to whatever we do. So, and when you have something and you improve quality of life, that's what medicine I think is about. Not curing disease because we don't cure too much many disease, but we certainly improve quality of life. And that's the main part for me. That's a really good description. I mean, it does make me think of when you see people that have the most horrible kind of heteronitis separativa and they're in your office and you know, they've been a million places. And, and I used to say, look, 
I don't know that I'm going to cure you, but I'm going to make you really as comfortable as humanly possible. And I won't give up until you're happy. And you just say, oh, really? Like somebody isn't shunning them. And, you know, all the committees we were on and the things like that, that really made this happen. And and there's differences globally in how people are treating it and surgery and all this stuff. But it's been a very interesting journey. I guess when you think back in our careers, there's many different segments. This will be the post-travel segment. <laughs> it's like, this is the new normal. And boy, it should have to have a gun to my head to get me to go anywhere now. Uh, I just live in the basement. But it's a very challenging time. So moving forward, you know, it, it sounds like your plans are trying to get rid of some of the burden and also to try and find out. Are you still playing hockey? Well, you know, I do pound hockey right now. I'm not playing in a team anymore, but we're a group of people and we have actually a pound just next to my house. So I can put almost my skates inside and, and walk to the pond. Okay. So we do this and, you know, every winter, it, it, there's always a few days where the conditions are absolutely perfect. And as you know, uh, Professor Neil, I have a cottage in the Laurentian. It's by a lake. And there, winter months, it's always nice. So we, we put our rink there and we go skating right in front. We had a great experience last winter, you know, because of the COVID. We happened to spend five months there, which was absolutely not expected, which has been actually the five best months of my past 30 years, I would say. And actually, the lake was all frozen and the lake is 13.5 kilometer long, okay? And there's zero people there in, in winter. You don't see anyone, all right, okay? And the lake was a perfect ice, Neil. It was fantastic. I was with my wife. We would skate and skate and skate and shoot the puck and have to, you know, skate two kilometers to get the puck back. So that's what the kind of hockey that I'm doing right now. I, I don't score goals anymore. So let's put it this way. No, but nobody's checking you either, which is sort of nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After you get into your 60s, it stops being so interesting. But that's really terrific. Yeah, it's a nice thing. Just a beautiful image of that on a sunny day on a beautiful sheet of ice that's flat and being able to just be there and enjoy the moment. Yeah, that's terrific. And so you really don't know, I suppose, what's going to be coming up next when you sort of wind things down. I'm not sure that it will depend on me, uh, Professor Neil. I think it will depend on the people who ask me to do stuff. You know, I realize that uh, I am part of my career that I, for some industry, I might not be as interesting as I used to be because that's the way it is. You know, you don't write prescriptions anymore and so on. So uh, I will see what happens, you know, and presently uh, I love what I'm doing. I do a lot of continuing medical education. I did one for two hours yesterday with the uh, University of Montreal, which I was absolutely fantastic. We had a great time. So I'm looking forward for these things. So it seems that 2022 will also bring quite a few of these events, which I like you. I really like to do. So uh, as long as I am asked, I will probably keep saying yes until I cannot do it anymore. But we'll see what happens. I don't think it depends on me right now. I think you will be asked and I can guarantee it. But you know, the thing is, you, you sort of feel around what is right for you, and people will ask you. You're definitely a global asset, and you've done so much, and you're such a great communicator, one of the best speakers I've ever heard. I can't imagine opportunities not coming up, but that's really exciting. And especially after this podcast goes out, your phone will be ringing off the hook. because. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure if the colors are good, but I'm sure that my cheeks are red right now. So you're making me flush. <laughs> Actually, they are, but uh, that's a good quality of the camera. No, so it's really nice, Mark. I really appreciate it. Is there anything else that you wanted to add or something you even thought, boy, when I get on this podcast, I, I really want to say this? I guess, you know, that never forget my colleagues, my peers, never forget that we're there for patients. If the patients would not be there, we would not be here. And uh, the reward, you know, to be able to help some people in their life, I think is a privilege. And I don't think we should ever forget this. So, so that's maybe something. And my another wish may be that I may have is that I wish somebody that I would interview you. <laughs> that's my wish. <laughs> okay, we'll do that. But that's a wonderful message. I think you're right. You know, with all the pressures of practice and COVID or not, I mean, sometimes you forget to think of the patient's perspective over and over again. And, you know, patient-related outcomes and all that sort of stuff is really a big deal. Things are taking time happening, but they are bit by bit. Right now, there's a tsunami of information with the COVID story. 
And it just changes every hour, it seems. Because of the volume that takes, it pushes out other news. It's a strange time. So hopefully we'll get through all of this stuff together. And again, I want to thank you. And thank you so much for summarizing your caring and your passion for all of this. I thank you very much. I thank you very, very much. You're the best, Mark. Looking forward to give you a hug. (laughs) Thank you. Actually, that'd be nice. Anyways, on on the lake. So actually, I don't think I put my skates away. I have no idea where they are now. Thank you, Dr. Mark Bursier, so much for participating in the podcast today. My pleasure and stay well. If you'd like to learn more about Hydrodonitis suppurativa, one of the subjects discussed today, visit www.hsonline.ca. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and colleagues. On our next episode, Neil will chat with another guest from the world of dermatology. To subscribe, go to www.derm.city or find the SLP podcast at Apple iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Support for the SLP podcast was provided by Leo Pharma Canada. Send your comments to slp at chronicle.org. Until next time, happy holidays to all our listeners. And for 2022, our wish for you is, be well.